Thank you for having me. As Jay said, I'm Brian Ballard with Upskill. Uh, I'm going to walk you through um, some experiences we've had developing uh, solutions for the industrial world uh, around augmented and assisted reality and show you a little bit about how people are using it um, at scale. But hopefully you guys can hear me okay. This is my uh, fifth, I think, uh, AWE at this point, and it's essentially become a yardstick for the progress of AR, machine learning, mixed reality, computer vision. Um, and the advances in each of those has really, I think, moved our domain forward. But the progress um, that the practitioners we do doesn't stand still between, I think, our uh, annual pilgrimage to the Santa Clara Convention Center. But the result in progress that we've seen has, um, I think, attributed to AR and wearable particular adoption at scale. And um, I'm sure this is what you all think of when it's augmented reality at scale, but I, I kid. We're talking about enterprise adoption. Um, and scale in this world is measured in depth of use. It's all day, every day wearability. It's the number of people that are employing this technology. Um, and the factors that contribute to the adoption at scale are, are tangible and intangibles. Your tangibles are the better hardware that's come around that's enabled adoption. It's customers telling stories to each other, teaching each other how this adoption's benefited them. There's also the intangibles. Um, there's competitive pressures. There are um, you know, need to recruit uh, new employees into an environment that wants to see advanced technology being a part of the ecosystem rather than rather than I think uh, maybe a mental image of something that's that's been left behind. It's also about retention of knowledge. In my company Upskill, we've deployed wearable technology on thousands of people across a variety of different industries. And it's incredible progress, um, looking back to maybe AWE four years ago, but it's still shy of the millions of people that is our goal to upskill by giving them um, access to industrially relevant information uh, to, to Carl's point at the right time. Um, but this experience has given us insights into how customers like um, Boeing, Coca-Cola, Johnson & Johnson have moved through their journey of adopting this and taking it to scale. And hopefully we'll be able to, to give you some of those insights as well. So let me talk about the motivations of what causes people to scale. Um, you know, the conversation in populism right now looks at robots and says, are these going to replace us? And there's a counterpoint to that in the industry 4.0 conversation that says, no, not really. We're going to work along beside them. And industry 4.0 as a term is digitization manifest. It is in the design, it's in production, it's in service, it's through the entire product life cycle. And just to get to this point, it's millions of dollars of investment for even the smallest companies, billions for the premier companies in the world right now. But what it's created is a moat, a void of data interaction, excuse me, between our digitized big back end production systems and the people standing right next to it doing that work every day. And it's left out that workforce. Um, and companies, I think, you know, struggle in a way to find how to take advantage of tablets in a scaled format in the industrial environment. Essentially, it's better paper. It's a mobile wiki. It's an information lookup tool rather than something that's a human-centric tool. Now, obviously, I don't think any of us are, are future seers. If you were here uh, earlier, uh, Paul Davies showed an image from the early 80s. Uh, where wearable technology was obviously a choice for this, but things have, have uh, come around and it's driven, I think, our, um, our ability to adopt it, not necessarily our desire to adopt it. And the motivators for almost every company we talk to out there boil into these same five categories. It's efficiency. That's a productivity measure. Can I produce more faster? Can I get first-time quality up? Compliance, safety, machine utilization. These are the motivators of what drives every individual company we work with to adopt um, technology. There's also, um, you, know, you can boil these also into you know, both the intrinsic, maybe, sorry, not intrinsic, the implicit and the explicit. The implicit is, I want to be more competitive. Just as, an, as a human being, I like being at the top of my game. The explicit is, I just lost business to a competitor who's employing augmented reality to their field service workforce. I, I no longer differentiate against them. Or maybe I want to do that to my own business, bring augmented reality to serve my customers better. Those are the explicit uh, drivers that will tap into these. Um, last year, uh, 
at AWE, we brought one of our customers, Boeing, on stage who presented an example where they employed augmented reality at scale to drive a 30 percent plus productivity improvement for their production of uh, subcomponents for 737s. This is a company that has 8,000 planes on back order. That is a competitive need. How do you keep up? Do you build another factory? Do you throw more people at the problem? And the reality is, um, no. What, what companies have found is it's 10 times more cost effective to augment what you already have with wearable technology. So as an example, this is, this is simple math um, around labor rates that you'd see in, in your average logistics um, uh, workforce. At the head counts of 100 up to, up to 10,000 people, this is the dollar value economic impact of a 30% improvement. It is massive. Now, almost every company starts their journey, you know, maybe off this chart in the 1 to 10 range. That's not at scale. When you start employing it every day, you cross the 100, many hundreds, move into thousands. And that progress for most companies, I think, as we all know, has been slow. It has not been well published. It has not been the overnight success that, that maybe we thought it would have been in, in 2012. Now, part of that reason we see, and, and we see this across a um, number of our mainstream companies right now, there's been a decisive shift in the adoption rate over the last eight months. As a software company, this is, this is something that pains me a little bit because we always think, well, maybe if we just do a little bit more on the software side. The real answer to, I think, the, the biggest reason the shift has happened is next generation hardware. We now have second, third, and in some cases, actually fourth generation hardware coming into the market. Um, household names. You have Sony, Microsoft, Google, Intel, um, Epson. And you also have great startups like Daiquiri, ODG, and Realware that are innovating right beside these large companies. The hardware ecosystem is finally vibrant. It's also proven. Enterpri Who hears from an enterprise company? You guys don't adopt first generation technology normally, do you? Not at scale. You adopt off of a roadmap. The roadmaps happened. Now, what we also see is adoption is happening in two different trajectories. In the 2D assisted reality world, this is your Google Glass category of devices, adoption is happening um, very quickly. What we see on the um, immersive side is is about one generation behind, not entirely due to the hardware. There's actually a much more complex content requirement on that side too, which, which creates an um, adoption speed. Now, what we, uh, truth be told, both of these are still scaling, just at different velocities. My company is investing equally in both right now. It's very important, um, I think, uh, when you see where the technology is going to not miss the boat, but they're not replacing one another. Um, I think that's something important to say. We also see price stabilization happening, which is helping um, customers scale. On the assisted reality side, prices are stabilizing right around $1,000. We think in 2018 we'll start seeing more stabilization on the, the more immersive hardware. Um, but once you start having these things happen in the hardware space, large company procurement offices now know how to quantify this, budget for it. That's an, something I think as a technologist we often forget is important in the scale equation. These are problems that we've seen now, uh, or roadblocks I would say to adoption, that have been removed. The bottom line though is now that the hardware has hit a level of maturity, the ROI can be unlocked. <clears throat> With that ROI being unlocked, sorry, with the, with the hardware milestone um, being removed, what we see is the natural adoption forces are now coming into play. And the industrial definition of where investment is going is now including the workforce in a lot of companies around the world. Um, outside of my role at Upskill, I sit on a governing board uh, for the future productivity of the World Economic Forum. This conversation is happening in every country around the world, every industry. How do we upskill our workforce? How do we invest in the people, um, their skills, transference of job capabilities? Um, how do they interface with these other investments I've made to make sure that bottlenecks can be resolved in real time rather than planned out months in advance and maybe they work and we have to go back and reinvent them? Anyway, what we see is when you invest in people, the results are real. It's an untapped opportunity that's existed for decades that we're finally being able to go after. And when we work with our customers, we try and actually measure this. What we do as often as possible is we film it side by side. So I'm going to show you an example of how this has played out. Um, this is with GE Healthcare in a manufacturing facility. Um, what you'll see is a uh, kitting operation in the warehouse in support of manufacturer. One side of the screen will be the standard paper process. The other side is with smart glasses. It's the exact same guy, the exact same route. 
we've sped this up a lot, so hopefully it's not too fast. What you see is the person's getting the exact same information. One's in real time. One's happening without them having to put their hands down. Go back to a computer if they find a shelf is empty. The speed between the smart glasses based one on the bar is the top line, the light blue, bottom line is the baseline. And this is pretty, um, pretty indicative of what you see results-wise. That's just the impact. I'll go to the next slide and actually show you what they see, too, so it's not just uh, we sped up the, the screen a little bit. So this is an example of what the person would be seeing. They're given an information, I need to pick something, I need to put it on a specific portion of the cart. What you don't see is the other half of this process, where when that's received by the manufacturing technician, he knows exactly where to pull it out of the cart because there's a um, perfect coordination between the different parts of the business process. So you know, we see this in manufacturing and material handling. We're also seeing this happen um, now in field service. It's an example where uh, Coca-Cola is doing factory inspections, and this is now scaling from factory to factory to factory. And I'm not sure how many bottling plants they have, but it's in the hundreds, um, where all, the, all they needed to do was be able to equip their inspectors with a real-time surveying tool that shows them, here's what I need to do. I need remote assistance, no problem. My smart glasses have a forward-facing camera, and I can pull in the view of a centralized uh, expert to help me through something. Um, this was done uh, not by us, but by uh, a company called Pristine uh, that we acquired a month ago based on, like you guys, tr we were trying to learn more about the field service side of this technology, and we were able to, to merge with a company that had significant expertise in that. So what's next? Um, so what we see as scale has now happened in the initial um, sizes is this is going to start exploding in the market. We've seen uh, the underlying market dynamics of a provider in the space changing significantly um, over the last six months. We do expect to see our customers start using the productivity gains as competitive differentiators in the market. Um, first level adoption was generally done internally. Can I change my bottom line? We're seeing companies go after top line um, differentiation now. Uh, with this as it's now entered into the all day, every day use case. We also see the promise of fully immersive AR becoming more attainable over the next 18, 24 months. Um, we do not see this um, growing in place of, but in parallel with the 2D um, assisted reality devices that, that are already fairly pre prevalent. Um, we also see a massive opportunity in solving the content development problems. This is something that as practitioners at AWE, um, something that we actually hope people are engaged very heavily in, it will open up scale for this, the immersive side um, around the corner. So in closing, just a few takeaways. Um, one, augmented reality is here in the enterprise. It's driving ma massive uh, benefits for the adopters. Um, people matter. Uh, R&D. When, when we see companies engage in it in a small uh, lab environment, it might be on a handful of people, but make sure any engagement you do is human-centered. In order for this to be adopted at scale, you have to have people uh, in mind. How it fits, how wearable is it, what's the interaction paradigm? Uh, people are really good at rejecting things they, they don't feel uh, makes their job easier. So that's a, that's a little piece of advice. Um, and in closing, I think, you know, going back to the idea of AW as a yardstick, I think two to three years from now, you will not see someone on stage like me giving a presentation about scale. That will be a past tense term, and the new adopters will be called laggards. We're going to see a environment where the new, two, three years from now, the new um, features that we're rolling out, the new use cases are being opened up. That, I think, will be the, the topic of the day then. Any questions? Great, Brian. All right. Who's that? <laughs> Thanks for filling in the silence with uh, applause. <laughs> so, um, questions for Brian. Can we get the Slido uh, page up? And that was the question from Carl. So, uh, I've, guess, se I've uh, seen this question before. I guess we'll take it live. Sure. Um, depends on the use case. Um, we'll do uh, integrations um, with complex systems for logistics, for complex assembly, and for field service. There's also um, use cases that take no solution time. It's really around the remote expert. It's a uh, turnkey out of the box day one. Um, some of the longer ones we've done have taken a couple months, but you're dealing with really complex um, data sources and the logic that, that interacts not only between maybe two different data sources to feed one person, 
but synchronize and orchestrate use cases where you might have interdependencies between different people in different roles. And getting that right, you want to make sure it's done perfectly and, and through QA. All right, cool. All right. Thanks, Brian. My pleasure. <laughs>